Hello, I'm Father Nathan. Welcome to those of you who are just joining us. I don't have an English accent, but sometimes I can pretend I do. Let's say, let's say a quick prayer. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, uh, we thank you for the ways in which you have uh, opened our lives up to the truth and for your will for us. We ask that you would help us to walk forward in faith in you and uh, in your plan. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, um, so do you all have the handout? You don't have the handout. Um, you got one. From yeah, yes, last time? No, from this time. Oh, we should well, pick that up. That's all right. <laughs> so I just found out that Father Matt, um, um, is this Karina? Yeah. Oh, hi, Father Nathan. What uh, Halloween candy do you like? Uh, Reese's. All right. <laughs> this is a wide dis- dispersion. Okay, um, so this is Karina. You'll get to know everybody else, you know, later. Um, so Father Matt was kind enough to print off all of the slides that we're going to use. I got some of his slides. So um, if the slide that's up, the, the slide that I'm on is not the one that's up here, we're just going to keep going. You just get bonus material to review at home. I, I just find that we only go till 8.15, is that right? Right. Right. Um, so I like, I like to take a break, um, and I like to finish on time. So that's my goal, right? So I'm just letting you know that um, there's, there's a little less material that I have in my packet than you have in your packet. So if I don't cover it, it's not because I don't think it's important. It's that I actually, like... Uh, Want to eat ice cream tonight, so I'm ready to go. Anywho, um, so um, I just want to welcome all of you first and foremost. Uh, I do give a plea every year to anybody who wants to become Catholic or interested in becoming Catholic. And uh, I'm always amazed that people show up, frankly, um, that they're willing to kind of um, just open themselves up to this pursuit and this kind of, um, yeah, inquiry. And so just so you know, like you're not on a log flume. You know, sometimes you get on the log flume, it sounds like a really good idea that you get on the log flume and then start on the log flume and you're like, I don't want to be on the log flume anymore. And and that's okay. Like, it's not, uh, I don't make a a sale if you become Catholic and then I get steak knives. So the, the real question that you're wrestling with are some of these questions that Father Matt's already outlined with you in the first class. But we're going to make a proposal And that proposal is an invitation, it's uh, a free gift, um, and we desire for you to participate in what we believe is God's will uh, for the entire world. Um, So, um, but I just wanted to offer that to you, I know it's only like the second class and I'm already telling you you can bail, Um, but it's not a question of you have to do this. We're going to make a proposal and we want you to want to. Um, but I'm not going to, you know, lay a hold of you and be like, ha ha, you have to do this now at Easter. Um, we're, we're going to kind of walk through these things together. So, um, just to review, uh, the five key questions, um, I, is this what you studied last week? Yes. So, uh, Father Matt's kind of outlined a lot of this. This is, these are some major questions that we're going to get through. Um, it, and that's not tonight. I, I would think that these are kind of really profound questions. We're actually going to try to cover two of them, and I think that even that's ambitious. So, is there truth, right? Uh, That's the question that um, Pontius Pilate asks Jesus when he says to him, um, everyone who hears the truth hears my voice, and Pontius Pilate says, what is truth? Everyone wants to know what what the truth is, and does God exist? Can we know that truth exists? And, um, Does God exist? And do they kind of coincide? Um, Is there revelation? If there is a God, has that person said anything? Because that would be kind of important. Um, And we believe that he has said something, and namely, uh, not just given us a word, but also given us the word, namely Jesus Christ. Is Jesus Christ God, and did Jesus start the Catholic Church? Um, because a lot of people believe that Jesus is God, but then it's like, well, it's this whole appendix of the Catholic Church. So um, these are what we're going to assert, that we can know the truth. God does exist. God has spoken to us. Uh, Jesus Christ is God. 
and Jesus started the Catholic Church. The difficulty of explaining why I am Catholic is that there are 10,000 reasons, all amounting to one reason, that Catholicism is true. There's a great line in an old hymn that says, Truth himself speaks truly, or there's nothing true. If God's not giving us the truth, then who can we really trust? So we're actually in the pursuit of truth, which is good. This is a, a pretty important thing for you to be doing on a Tuesday night instead of dancing with the stars or whatever it's on. Whatever's on tonight. So uh, if you haven't noticed, Patrick's just joining us. I know Patrick because um, I just did his wedding. So the main question, Patrick, is what is your favorite Halloween candy? Um, Snickers. Ah, see? That's the first overlap that we have. Oh, we had two candy corns. So anyways, you'll, you can find out what everybody else likes later. Um, so what is truth, right? When you say something is true, how do you know that it's true? Truth is when our mind perceives and judges reality the way it exists. The reason why we find humor humorous is because people are able to point out truths. And the truth, actually, like, we recognize it. If all of a sudden, like, there was a big bowl of Halloween candy here, you would say, like, there's candy there, can I have some, right? But I'm like, there's no candy there. It's like, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a big bowl of candy. And I would say, oh, it's, you're, you're, that's a figment of your imagination. Like, at some point, we have to say, no, what is true is what reality demonstrates to us. Not alter reality or virtual reality. Sure, we can give an impression that there is that. I mean, you've seen those sort of 3D paintings where it looks like you can almost grab it, but it's just a, a painting. But truth is when our mind perceives reality the way that it exists. We see things as they really are. The truth doesn't conform to us. We conform to the truth. It's not up to us to determine what true things are. We actually conform ourselves to true things. If I were to say, that's not a wall, or that's not a window, and you said, no, that's actually a window, or a wall, and I'm like, no, I can walk through it, you would say, let's see you try. <laughs> if I ran full speed at that, I, my mind would conform to the reality, and my body would conform to the reality. So we actually have to perceive reality as it demonstrates to us. One of the fundamental principles of philosophy is the principle of non-contradiction. Something can't be and not be at the same time, right? You can't both be here and somewhere else at the same time. That would be strange. Now, you may have heard that some uh, saints have done that, we call that bilocation. That is beyond, that is beyond nature as nature presents itself to us. That is supernature, right? Super Natural. Who, who sang that? I was trying to figure that. Is that? And that's not Prince, is it? Anyways, there's some song called Supernatural. Anyways, seeking the truth is not about finding what works for you, but finding the truth about how things really work. Mm -hmm. Discerning and discovering and pursuing the truth as it demonstrates it to us is one of the faculties that we have from our very existence because we are homo sapiens, right? We are man-wisdomers, man-knowers. We desire to know. The monkey desires to eat. The monkey doesn't think to himself, is this too many points on my diet? How will I look in spring if I consume this many bananas? They, they're not knowers in the same way that we are knowers. So we actually have this pre-programmed nature to know. So our faith, which is the pursuit of the truth that is beyond, faith seeks understanding, right? Many of you have seen, you know, Brian Regan where he says, how do I get that goodness in me? We may kind of present all these truth, these truths, um, but we also want to know, and how does that truth apply to me? What is my role in all of this? And that's where understanding comes into play. So anytime you see this CCC, did Father Matt explain that? We have this big book, which um, if any of you are interested in kind of uh, receiving, uh, we'll happily get that for you. It's called the Catechism of the Catholic Church. 
Effectively, uh, we wanted to put together a sure guide for people who were trying to understand what is the Catholic Church? What do they teach? What do they promote? What do they believe in, right? And so it follows these main pillars of, of uh, the creed, namely, like, what are the dogmas that we believe? Uh, sacraments, how do we apply the, the truths of faith to our lives from God? Um, moral life, now having received that from God, how do we respond? And then prayer, um, how do we respond to God's invitation? Um, so CCC is the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 158 is just a paragraph number. So it says, faith seeks understanding. It is intrinsic to faith that a believer desires to know better the one in whom he has put his faith. And to understand better what he has revealed, a more penetrating knowledge will in turn call forth a greater faith, increasingly set afire by love. I think I deleted a line, but understood. I don't know why I said that. Um, we're not asking you to just accept this on blind faith. Maybe you've seen uh, different religions where it's just like, you don't need to know anything, man. Just feel it, right? There's a MacGyver episode where um, he's like trying to decide whether or not he's still in love with this nun who's working in the Amazon or something like that. And, um, and uh, MacGyver is like trying to like make her believe that she loves him. And then uh, eventually she goes, I just don't know what to think anymore. And MacGyver takes his hand and then like puts it on her heart and he goes, don't think, feel. <laughs> this is a real episode. Um, we're not telling you to do that, right? Maybe you've had people tell you, if you read this book, you'll get this feeling in your heart and you'll know that it's true. We actually are going to make a reasonable proposal because what God is actually doing comes from his own life, which is ordered, harmonic. It's love. So um, we actually pursue the truth in faith so that we can more uh, deeply understand. St. Augustine uh, said, I believe in order to understand, and I understand the better to believe. Like, it's a, the more you come to know something, the more you want to, to learn more about it. That happens in relationship. That happens when you, like, start playing golf or, I don't know, listen to a music band uh, that you're just like, wow, like, I want to know more. Where are these people from? What are their other tracks? Like, you, you, you can't help but receive more of it. So what is faith? What? Did I skip one? Oh. How did I go backwards? Oh, see, I, I deleted this one. It's just kind of like another explanation of what faith is. Um, yeah, I mean, okay. Faith is, first of all, a personal adherence of man to God. This is Catechism 150. At the same time, it is a free assent to the whole truth that God has revealed. We want to assent to the truth. Not just conform to it like, oh, that's a wall, and I guess like I have to live my life in accordance with that wall. There's a point at which God is inviting us to assent to the reality that he has proposed because in cooperating with that reality, we find our truest self. We actually come to a deeper uh, relationship with him and with one another. So if we follow the directions, we tend to do better in making the cake or like setting up the board game or whatever else. God actually has an order and faith isn't just all right, God, like, I guess, I'll, I guess I'll do what you want. It's actually, oh, this is how you play the game, and this is how I was created, and this makes, this makes sense. So that's faith, all right? So now we get into the big question. That's why Father Matt left today, because he wanted me to do, you know, the heavy lifting of does God really exist? Dun, 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 but he left me a YouTube video. <laughs> exist? Or is the material universe all that is, or ever was, or ever will be? One approach to answering this question is the cosmological argument. It goes like this. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe 
has a cause. Is the first premise true? Let's consider. Believing that something can pop into existence without a cause is more of a stretch than believing in magic. At least with magic you've got a hat and a magician. And if something can come into being from nothing, then why don't we see this happening all the time? No, everyday experience and scientific evidence confirm our first premise. If something begins to exist, it must have a cause. But what about our second premise? Did the universe begin? Or has it always existed? Atheists have typically said that the universe has been here forever. The universe is just there, and that's all. First, let's consider the second law of thermodynamics. It tells us the universe is slowly running out of usable energy. And that's the point. If the universe had been here forever, it would have run out of usable energy by now. The second law points us to a universe that has a definite beginning. This is further confirmed by a series of remarkable scientific discoveries. In 1915, Albert Einstein presented his general theory of relativity. This allowed us, for the first time, to talk meaningfully about the past history of the universe. Next, Alexander Friedman and George Lemaitre, each working with Einstein's equations, predicted that the universe is expanding. Then in 1929, Edwin Hubble measured the red shift in light from distant galaxies. This empirical evidence confirmed not only that the universe is expanding, but that it sprang into being from a single point in the finite past. It was a monumental discovery, almost beyond comprehension. However, not everyone is fond of a finite universe, so it wasn't long before alternative models popped into existence. But one by one, these models failed to stand the test of time. More recently, three leading cosmologists, Arvind Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin, proved that any universe which has on average been expanding throughout its history cannot be eternal in the past, but must have an absolute beginning. This even applies to the multiverse, if there is such a thing. This means that scientists can no longer hide behind a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Any adequate model must have a beginning, just like the standard model. It's quite plausible then that both premises of the argument are true. This means that the conclusion is also true. The universe has a cause. And since the universe can't cause itself, its cause must be beyond the space-time universe. It must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, uncaused, and unimaginably powerful. Much like God. The cosmological argument shows that, in fact, it is quite reasonable to believe that God does exist. Technology, get me out of here. All right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, cosmos, um, it's where we get the same word uh, for kind of cosmopolitan or uh, cosmo, uh, cosmetologist. Kind of the beauty uh, that is in the world. And so when people are making cosmological arguments, they are making an, uh, an argument for the order of beauty. Because when they looked up at the stars, they would say, well, where did this all come from? So if we're looking out at the world, not just at the stars or whatever, but like even each other or the mountains or like this jar of peanut butter, like we would have to say, this didn't just come out of nowhere. It has a, a beginning, and it must have a cause. We know that the universe and time began to exist. 
You can read this in all of these different theories that were listed, but especially in the, the Big Bang theory, you know, we're actually making a claim that at one point in time, everything that wasn't was, and that all of a sudden, like, it was created in this expansive way. So in order for us to say that something outside of time created all things, then they have to, they, there has to be a cause to that, right? And you could say, well, maybe that was a lesser God, or maybe it was, um, you know, like not uh, Thor, but the God before Thor. And then you can make all of these different arguments, but ultimately you arrive that there has to be one. And that one has to be eternal. It has to be outside of time. It can't be a material being, because in order for a material being to give something that's spiritual, you can't have uh, something uh, lesser give rise to something greater. And it has to be extremely powerful. And this one we call God. So that's kind of in short the, the cosmological argument. I'm not here to try to... Um, say that any one of these are going to disprove your um, uh, perhaps belief that, that God doesn't exist, but we have to keep kind of pointing back to without this, like we're, we're on different pages because we're dealing with the world as it proposes to, it to ourselves, but other people are like, no, we think that it's a different world and we don't believe that there's a God, but we're actually making the claim that Truth is, does exist, and that truth has an order, and the orderedness of creation points back to a, a much larger being. So, so time began to exist. That's the, 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 the kind of first claim. Only two options. Time began or always was. If time always was, there would be an infinite number of days before today. It is impossible to transverse an infinite. You can't count to infinity and finish. So how would I get to today if I had to cover an infinite number of days to get here? That doesn't make sense, so time must have a beginning. Imagine two people running a 30-yard dash, right? But then uh, you say that I'm going to cut the time in half. And then uh, the one person is ahead and the other person behind. And then I'm going to cut that time in half. And I'm going to cut that time in half and that time in half. At some point, you can say that never would that person arrive at the end of the 30-yard dash. But we see that all the time. That you can have a point in time and an end point in time. You also can't do the same thing going backwards, right? There was a time beforehand. And there was a time before that, and there was another time before that. And, and all of those times add up to an infinite regression. There is this moment in time, but then there is a moment in time where there wasn't time, and that is what we call eternity. So all of us have this longing in our hearts to pass back into eternity. Whenever we say we want something to last forever. We're not just saying we want it to last for infinity. We want it to last from the beginning, now, and unto ages of ages. That we want to participate in something that's actually much, much greater uh, than ourself. Mm, so then there's another argument, right? Argument from causality. This is the one that I frankly prefer. I mean, uh, Father Matt is much more scientific, so I think he likes the the uh, cosmological argument a little more. So everything that begins to exist has a cause for its existence, right? If you have a pie, then at some point there was uh, a pie maker. Or if you want to get even more kind of elaborate, before there was a pie, there were cherries. And before there was the cherry, there was the cherry tree. And before there was the cherry tree, there was perhaps the field that, that was yet to be. Uh, come on, are you in here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> What's up? The, um, uh, so you can go back all the way, but at some point you have to have one that's upholding all of it. Right? So before you had the pie and the cherries and whatever else, you eventually need to have the earth. And before you had the earth, you, you didn't have that. And there must be one that actually created all of it in order for it to exist. There must be a first cause to start everything going, a.k.a. God, right? How many of you played monkeys in a barrel whenever you were a kid? 
maybe not a terribly popular game among the, the younger kids these days, but there used to be a time where there were like these two, these two monkeys, one had one hand like this and the other had the other, and you had to scoop in and pull out another monkey, right? And so you could have this chain of events where you had monkey after monkey after monkey after monkey. But at some point, you have to acknowledge, what's holding all of this up? Is it the monkey? Or is it the hand that ordered all of it together with the design in mind? So uh, we call that hand God. But God isn't just like the hand that sort of upholds everything like, you know, the, the I don't know, the, the puppeteer or whatever. Um, yes, so if everything is caused, we're still in the argument from causality, if everything is caused by something else, can there ever be, can there be an infinite regression of causes? No, right? If you see a light on, a lamp, you have to assume that that lamp is plugged into somewhere else, but the power isn't coming here, or I guess I should just use a computer, the power isn't just coming here, the power is coming from somewhere else. And so you have to keep going back until eventually you get to the power plant. You wouldn't just walk in and you just say, like, oh, that, that computer is always on. It always stays on, no matter what. There's actually something keeping that awake or whatever. And so it has to be plugged in. Uh, I don't know. That was Father Matt's thing. You can't borrow a lawnmower that no one owns. You can't say that something will exist uh, when it's not even there. Um, so if causality is passed down, it must have started with an uncaused cause, a.k.a. God. What Aristotle described as an uncaused cause is an unmoved mover. In order to get everything moving, one had to be fixed. It's not like you had this, this continual swaying and then eventually like all these things you know, happened. You had one that pushed it all into existence. Still in the same, still in a different argument. Uh, I'm going to do this last argument, and then we're going to kind of talk about these ones. I don't like this. I like seeing everything all at once. Just do it. Um, so this is similar to the cosmological argument, uh, but it's kind of saying everything is ordered. Everything has this intelligent design that one didn't just... Uh, sit down at a typewriter and randomly type, and then all of a sudden, like, you know, I don't know, the, the script from Golden Girls came out. Um, there, there must have been someone with a design in mind. The universe displays an amazing amount of design. This intelligible order is either the product of chance or the product of design, right? Maybe some of you have tried to be Jackson Pollock at some point and just throw a bunch of paint on a canvas, and you're like, I could do that too, um, there's a reason why uh, he had a, a, a great career and you may not have the same great career. And it's part of it is because you have to have a design in mind. It's not random chance. If there's only chance, then how do we understand order? You can't have random chance produce a computer. You can't have random chance produce all of the molecular structures that keep us alive at every moment. The constraints of the universe are extremely fine-tuned for life. They are not chaotic. Even evolution presupposes an order, that there is a fittest. Therefore, the universe is the product of intelligent design. If there is a design, there must be an intelligent designer. Right? Interior designer. And he is uh, well, he's the one we call God. Um, so when we look at music or art or even nature, we actually acknowledge there's, there's a deep order in all of this and there's something in us that wants to get behind this this image and actually say what created all of this like where did all of this come from um who is this one that would so kind of generously pour forth all of that for us and that's the one that we describe as god right so um we have one more we have one more video i promise this is it uh, but uh, do you have any questions on those uh, brief proofs before we kind of go through? Don't be shy. We're kind of jet skiing as I describe this you know, kind of course. It's like you're going over deep waters 
And don't feel like at any point, like, we won't allow you to swim. If you just want to sit with something for a moment and just say, yeah, I don't, I don't know about that, or I don't know what that means for me, or anything. Yeah. <clears throat> Brendan. Uh, yes. Navigator. Uh, didn't the, the, the cosmological argument for Schultz with Thomas Aquinas... Yeah, a lot of these proofs, a lot of these proofs were shared not only by Aristotle but uh, T- Thomas Aquinas. So Saint Thomas Aquinas, uh, priest in the 13th century, 11th. Anyways, um, uh, before our time, um, uh, wanted to give a reasoned explanation for God's existence, and not just immediately go into because the Bible tells us so. He's actually using philosophy. Uh, which kind of looks at the world and looks at order and says that there is a truth that we can mine from this. And as we look at this order, as we look at this um, design, uh, even these causes, we can say that there must be one who is, um, who is greater than us. Aristotle describes that one as the unmoved mover. When, when Thomas describes it, he's getting, he may start there, but he wants to move us quickly into, this is the one we describe as God. Because when we, when we start personalizing this, it's not just God is this, this mega machine that created all of it. He's actually an infinitely perfect, loving being, who uh, the source of all being, who desires for us to participate in his own life. So... Um, he wasn't just trying to win an argument. He was trying to make a reasoned explanation for uh, the truth of why we exist. So you can look those up if you want. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, our five proofs for the existence of God. It's in the first part of the Summa, second question, part three. And the only reason why I know that is because it's one, two, three. So, anyways. Any other questions or comments? They want to see the video. This, this one's kind of, so uh, this one's sort of uh, ex- explaining that last one about intelligent design, that it's not just that like, okay, maybe he got it right, you know? Like you've seen those kids on the spelling bee where like they have a lot of intelligence, but like sometimes they say a word and they're like, uh, Q, Y, V, Prince, sign, whatever, like they are actually able to get it right. God didn't just get it right. The one that we're describing is God didn't just get it right. He, he, he designed everything down to the last kind of uh, molecule. And it's, and From galaxies it's and fine. stars, what it's down doing. to atoms and subatomic particles. The very structure of our universe is determined by these numbers. These are the fundamental constants and quantities of the universe. Scientists have come to the shocking realization that each of these numbers has been carefully dialed to an astonishingly precise value, a value that falls within an exceedingly narrow, life-permitting range. If any one of these numbers were altered by even a hair's breadth, no physical, interactive life of any kind could exist anywhere. There'd be no stars, no life, no planets, no chemistry. Consider gravity, for example. The force of gravity is determined by the gravitational constant. If this constant varied by just one in 10 to the 60th parts, none of us would exist. To understand how exceedingly narrow this life permitting range is, imagine a dial divided into 10 to the 60th increments. To get a handle on how many tiny points on the dial this is, compare it to the number of cells in your body or the number of seconds that have ticked by since time began. If the gravitational constant had been out of tune by just one of these infinitesimally small increments, the universe would either have expanded and thinned out so rapidly that no stars could form and light couldn't exist, or it would have collapsed back on itself with the same result. No stars, no planets, and no life. Or consider the expansion rate of the universe. This is driven by the cosmological constant, A change in its value by a mere one part in 10 to the 120th parts would cause the universe to expand too rapidly or too slowly. In either case, the universe would, again, be life-prohibiting. Or another example of fine-tuning. 
If the mass and energy of the early universe were not evenly distributed to an incomprehensible precision of one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123rd, the universe would be hostile to life of any kind. The fact is, our universe permits physical, interactive life only because these, and many other numbers, have been independently and exquisitely balanced on a razor's edge. Wherever physicists look, they see examples of fine-tuning. The remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. If anyone claims not to be surprised by the special features that the universe has, he's hiding his head in the sand. These special features are surprising and unlikely. Seasons. So, um, the beauty of all of that, and this would make for a good meditation, you know, like as you're kind of going through your own day or your own uh, kind of uh, drive or whatever, turn off the radio and just start to ponder, like, out of all the millions upon billions of possible ways in which everything could have been created, it was created in this way. And it's all for the possibility of life. And then the question becomes, what ought I to do with that life? Does one know um, how, we should, how we should live? And that's part of the reason why truth is important. That's the reason why the, the question of whether God exists is important. Because if there's an intelligent design and there's an intelligent designer, then I can be in communion with that one to actually discern and discover what the purpose of my life is all about. So when we talk about God, we don't just say God has unity or God has goodness. He is these things. God is described as simple. He's not just, um, I don't know, like he could be much smaller, smarter, but he's just very simple. He, he, he is, his being is sim simple because uh, it is um, part of who he is. God is one. God is eternal. He is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. Or as Homer Simpson says, God can make a burrito so large he cannot eat it, right? Um, but, I mean, then that would prove that God doesn't exist. But if he could make a burrito that he could not eat it, he could, you know. God, is, God alone can do all of those things. So when we look at creation, when we look at creation, we're saying that creation must exist in a particular way. Um, and when Christians... Oh, rats. Wait a second. Did he skip over that? How do I go back? How did I just go back before? Bloop, bloop. Um, this one is actually a very, very good uh, uh, argument. It, even if it's just... It's not necessarily proving that God exists. It's really putting the, the onus on us. So this is what... Uh, Blaise Pascal was a famous mathematician as well as philosopher. And he says, he says, well, if you don't believe that God exists, you can make this short kind of gambling uh, wager. There's really only two, two options, believe or not believe. If you believe in God and he doesn't exist, you still live a good life. And a good life has value even if there is no God. If he does exist, then the, you live that good life and we believe that living a good life is conducive to the life of heaven. So, bonus. Either way, you win. You win in this earth, and you win uh, in heaven, or you win just on this earth, and people still remember you. If you don't believe in God, you know, that's kind of, you know, that, that's another way to do it, and he doesn't exist, you live a sinful life. You take anything and everything you want, and nobody really likes being around you because you're only in it for yourself, and you die, and then you cease to exist, and, well, that was a good run. Um, and, or if he doesn't, does exist, and you live a sinful or horrible or bad life, um, then there is this little thing called hell, and we certainly, if that does exist, if you're making the wager that that does exist, you want to try to avoid that, so, you know, play the chips where you will, right? So creation. Um, I, I don't want to get too much into creation. Um, Father Matt's got uh, plenty on this. The important things about creation that we hold as Christians, uh, as Catholics, is that the universe was created ex nihilo, 
right? Out of nothing. The world was formless and void when God created it. Uh, there was nothing in the world, and God was able to shape all of it together. If we were to say that, no, 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 no God had like sort of Plato parts, and he fashioned everything together, and then he made the world, then the question becomes, who made the Plato parts? If God's just working with Legos and creating this world, then who made the Legos? He has to create out of nothing, or he's not really God. Um, so he wills everything into existence um, as an expression of his goodness and grandeur. He wants us to look upon the world and say, wow, not only is this world good, but the one who created it is good. Beauty, goodness, truth, all of these are footprints of God's will for creation. So how, what, did, what did exactly God create? So you have one who is before everything else that is. Before anything else was created, there was God, who, as we said, is all of those attributes. God is good. God is true. God is all-powerful. God is in, infinite, eternal, etc. Um, so he's not part of creation. He's the creator. Everything else, uh, apart from God, are creatures. I know that's hard for us to think about or, or to even stomach at times, but I'm just a creature. Dogs are creatures, uh, rocks are creatures, trees are creatures. You can have uh, varying levels of creatures, but ultimately I'm not the creator and therefore I'm simply a creature. First and foremost, God creates a spiritual realm, uh, an angelic realm as we describe it. So they, these beings are pure spirits, they do not have bodies. We believe that God was able to create uh, messengers that would accomplish his will. Um, so it's hard to say uh, whether or not like all of these angels uh, participated in creation, but I think it's a really beautiful thing to imagine God sending them out into the, into the universe to kind of accomplish his will. So they are pure spirits. They have no bodies. They had a choice to love and serve God or not. He made angels persons. They had wills. They had intellects. They weren't just robots. They weren't just, um, I don't know, created slaves. He invited them to participate in his own life, and they had to decide whether or not they wanted to choose to follow God or not. The angels, the good angels, are the ones who chose to serve God and love God. The demons, or the fallen angels, were the ones that chose to hate God. Uh, to fight against him. Many people say that uh, the reason why demons, um, the reason why demons fell, is because eventually they were told that they would have to serve humans, and humans were kind of disgusting to them because humans had both matter and spirit. They're kind of this this joining of the bodily realm, the material realm, and the spiritual realm. We're not just bodies. We have souls, and uh, our bodies and souls create this person. They weren't, going to create, they weren't going to have to serve, ultimately, just a human person, but it was actually going to be God himself that would condescend to become a man. Spoiler alert. Um, so then, humans. Humans are body and spirit. They are rational beings. They are uh, homo sapiens. They can know. They can love. They can will, they can choose. Animals are living and sensing, but not spiritual. Your dog isn't thinking to himself, um, I don't know, I, I really want to really grow in my faith this year. I just feel distant from, from my owners and from whatever, and I'm, I'm really going to make intentional acts to try to uh, grow in a deeper intimacy with them. Uh, they do live and sense, and in a mysterious way, they, can, they, they almost have the ability to comprehend until you just look at them and all they're thinking is food, 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 uh, or play with me, whatever. Um, plants are living, but we wouldn't necessarily say that plants have spirits. They are moving uh, away or uh, towards the light, um, but they're not necessarily choosing that for themselves. They have a nature that's kind of ordered that way. And then there's inanimate objects like rocks and mountains and whatever. And I mean, uh, they're, they're, not, they're not thinking to themselves. 
um, contrary to Boulder's belief. So again, like when we look out upon creation, like the, the beauty of the stars, the beauty of the mountains, or even the beauty of human life, we have to acknowledge there really is an order, there's a design, there's something that God wants us to perceive as we look at these things. And I just think, personally, I think it's to, to demonstrate to us that we are noble, that we have a nobility, that we're not just cogs in a wheel or part of this whole uh, structure that's, uh, I mean, just causing either our domination or our success or our downfall or whatever. God created us, uh, created us with an order and a purpose and a design, and he wants us to participate in that design. So in short, if you go home tonight and you read uh, Genesis 1 through 2, you're going to see the order of creation. God is, it says in the beginning, uh, in the beginning, uh, God created the heavens and the earth. And before God created, it was, it was formless and void. So God is going to create the form and he's going to fill the void. So first, there is darkness. And so he creates light. Day, uh, the, the light to separate uh, the, the day from the night. And then he, in the second day, he creates the sky and the sea, that there was just all of this water everywhere, and then eventually he separates it out. Third day, God creates the land and the vegetation, that the water was covering everything over the earth, and it had already been separated from the sky, but then God separates the land from the sea so that uh, you can start to use the pieces the way that, that he created them for. So he fills the void. It's not just that he wants to create this simple order. He actually wants to ennoble different parts of creation to take mastery over those places. So when he creates the sun and the moon, it's to create this order, one to rule the day and one to rule the night. The birds and the fish to fill up the sky and the sea, and then the beasts of the field and human beings to live on the land uh, with its vegetation. God is ordering all things to take their proper place in the world. He sets mankind over all of creation, not just to say, congratulations, you made it, you're the Lord and conqueror of all of it, but you are its servant. You till the land, you work the land. Um, he's ennobling mankind with, I'm giving all of this for you because I love you. Um, and then God rested. So mankind is sort of made on this teeter-totter. Man was made... Man and woman were made on the sixth day, along with the pumas and the jackasses and the rattlesnakes and the uh, whatever, spiders or whatever. Um, but he, would, he and she was, was also made for the seventh day. Mankind is the only creature that knows the order of time. You don't get a birthday card from your pet turtle. Um, and... Mankind is made, not just for the, the simple passing of days, but is made for the seventh day. We're actually made for work and for rest. God works, so work isn't bad, and God rests. And so God wants us to have uh, both. And it was very good. God wants us to know that he's in communion with the, with the world. We're not antagonists, we're not pests. We're not uh, creating all of this disorder because we're using up all of the world's resources and breathing up all of the air. God created this world for our enjoyment. Not that we don't have a, a, a custody or a care for the world, but he's given it to us because he loves us. All right, so, um, so now we get into, yeah, 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 I, I believe that the Big Bang Theory happened. I believe that creation you know, did happen um, that, that, you know, God created the heavens and the earth. But I think that he just sort of wound it all up and then threw it into, into the world. Um, this is where we get into the arguments around evolution. Um, and uh, this pope, Pope... Uh, I skip one again? What? Oh, I don't have this one, that's why. Um... Yeah, I didn't read this. I was like, long quote, boring. Uh, you can read it later. Sorry. <laughs> so this is kind of the order for which we were created for John Paul II. Please review it on your own time. All right, evolution, because I think this is super interesting. So um, this pope, Pope uh, Pius XII, was a pope at the time when evolution was starting to gain real traction. 
Now, evolution says that the world has kind of evolved from lower beings to what we have now, namely us. And um, we're not, you'll see, like, when we describe the, the, um, the order of creation, we're not oh. saying that God had to create the world in seven days or that it had to take billions of years. We're just saying that you have to believe that God created the world. If you come to a place where you're just like, yeah, I, I want to be Christian or I want to be Catholic or I, I want to be a believer, but I don't believe God created the world. You can believe that. You're just not, you're not a Christian. You're not, you're not actually participating in what we say as shared belief. But then also sometimes people believe, oh, okay, well, I believe that all of these things kind of existed, but then that whatever happened then, whatever Big Bang, that person is gone now, and we've just slowly kind of evolved into this other. So Pope uh, Pius XII has this to say in uh, one of these Vatican documents, Humani Generis, the generation of man. The teaching authority of the church does not forbid, in conformity with the present state of human sciences and sacred theology, research and discussions take place with regard to the doctrine of evolution. We're not saying you can't have those conversations. In as, it, is it, in as far as it inquires into the origin of the human body as coming from pre-existent and living matter. But the Catholic faith obliges us to hold that souls are immediately created by God. We can believe, like, I mean, you, you've seen, like, the National Geographic magazines that, you know, we evolve from these ape-like creatures and that, you know, slowly you get, you know, crow Magnum Man and, and Hobo, Homo Laboris or whatever, where he's able to use tools or whatever. But there's something different about one who has a human soul. And to say that souls evolve is saying that immaterial realities um, actually develop principles uh, that are kind of uh, physical in nature. And physic, physical things can evolve. Immaterial things don't evolve. Your soul can learn different things through education, but you don't get like a, an updated soul. Like you don't go to sleep and get an Apple update, right? The soul you have is the soul you have. And you can't say that, well, yeah, if we just keep matter around long enough, eventually we'll come up with a new soul. We always have to believe that God is the one who uh, creates life. And it's not just that he's created the principles for life, that souls are immediately created by God, especially uh, eternal, immortal souls, because they share in God's properties. Matter, things of the world, can't give properties that it itself doesn't have. The world is not eternal. Therefore, it can't create in us uh, an eternal soul. Um, so... So yeah, as I said, you can, you can wrestle with how long it took the world to be created, but we're just trying to say that you do actually have to believe that God did create the world. And the Big Bang Theory, if you're like, well, I'm more of an advanced thinker or whatever, I, I don't necessarily think with the church on this. The Big Bang Theory was actually created by a Catholic priest. Not the sitcom, the actual theory. Um, but And then, all finally, Catholics do have to believe that God created the soul, and no amount of evolution can produce a spiritual soul. And then finally, uh, we come from one set of parents. This is important later, because if we're going to talk about the redemption of the whole world, that Christ is actually going to redeem the entire human race, if we didn't descend from one set of parents, then there's multiple human races. And Jesus would have only been one race, not like... Uh, Caucasian or Asian or, or Jewish or whatever, um, but rather like one set. You would now have human, Homo sapiens part one, Homo sapiens part two, etc. You have to diverge from one set of parents so that the, the, the gift of redemption would go all the way back to them. So as I said, God created the world for this purpose, for this design. He wants us to share in his own life. If you do find that you are interested, are we getting them catechisms, by the way, Father? That's a great question. That's a great question. It sounds like we are. 
Um, uh, so when you get your catechism and you're like super excited and you're like, here we go, big book, everybody wants to read, you know, point one, uh, see where it goes. This is actually the first paragraph of the catechism, which as with anything, you begin with the end in mind. If you're going to make creme brulee, right, you have to know what in your mind it's going to take to make creme brulee. But the whole point of creme brulee is so that you can enjoy it. Not just so you can create it, but so that you can enjoy it. Why does God create the world? Why does God create anything? What is the end that God has in mind when he creates angels, mountains, uh, pumas, and eventually you? This is the paragraph. God, infinitely perfect and blessed in himself in a plan of sheer goodness, freely created man to make him share in his own blessed life. What is the good that God wants us to share in? Himself. He has this idea that he's going to create the world in order that the world might be drawn back into him. For this reason, at every time and in every place God draws close to man, he calls man to seek him, to know him, to love him with all his strength. He calls together all men, scattered and divided by sin, into the unity of his family, the church. To accomplish this, when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son as Redeemer and Savior. In his Son and through him he invites men to become, in the Holy Spirit, his adopted children and heirs to his blessed life. So why are you here? Why are you here in this class? Why are you here on this earth? What is the purpose for which you were created? God. God had you in mind when he created the world, and it wasn't just that he left the treasure map and then went away, he's actually drawing you, even now, into his own life. He's calling you back into his own self. So, um, what does this mean for us? If we believe that God exists, then we say that God is real. He desires a relationship. He desires a relationship from us with himself. He doesn't just, he's not just that creeper friend that just like, I want to be your best friend and you're going to be my best friend and I'm going to call you all the time and we're going to hang out. He's actually fashioned in us a desire to be with him. He's elicited from us love because we created, he created us for love and he's inspired in us love for him. There is an infinite, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good being who made you for himself. God does desire us to participate in his own life and so how do we come to participate in that and in short uh, that's through prayer that's our break we're going to take a five minute break Um, uh, you're welcome to kind of share amongst yourselves thoughts whatever Um, we're going to cover the the last pages uh, of the thing very quickly so don't think that I'm going to try to go through point by point so five minutes Cheers. If you want, you can reflect on these questions in the meantime.
Anybody else watching the postseason? Baseball? 4 0. Rays. Merlander. I'm a Cardinals fan, so yesterday was pretty exciting. All right, so Father, Father Matt's not in here. But just remember. Class ends at 8.15. Class ends at 8.15. Just always stay strong on that. Okay? <laughs> um, the, uh, Shoot. Still recording. Uh, the, um, the temptation is, the temptation is, I got to tell you everything. Like, I gotta figure it all out, I gotta present all of it. And you're, we're hoping that you're gonna be here for a number of classes. So, uh, I, don't, I don't feel like we've gotta get all of our points made by, you know, nine o'clock at night to kind of beat it into you. Oh. Yeah. All right. Are we missing anyone? And she's not even she's not even a student. Let's just go. <laughs> so you recognize some of these questions, right? Um, what is the meaning of life? Why am I here? Why do I exist? What is my purpose? What am I supposed to be doing with my life? How can I find real happiness? Again, if you begin with the end in mind, why does God create at all? It's a demonstration of his love for us. And a demonstration of love is to elicit love. He wants us to love him in return. Um, and he's actually made us for love. But what am I made for? Is it just simply love or is it all these other things, right? Do whatever makes you feel good, money, an important job, Possessions, romance, um, you know, the anthem of the late 90s was, if it makes you happy, it can't be that bad, right? Is, am I seriously the only one from like 36 or whatever? Like, anyways, um, Cheryl Crow got it wrong. Uh, she tried, um, but we're not made uh, simply for the ephemeral happinesses that pass away. Right? Whatever the food is will, will be gone, and then you have to wait again. Whatever the game is, you know, even if it's the Broncos or whatever, one Super Bowl is not enough. You just have to keep living that high. Um, the, whatever possession you just purchased, you know, you, you boat, house, whatever, like, it does lead to some fulfillment. There's some satisfaction in it. But there has to be more. There has to be more than just these simple things. And that's because we were made for more than the world can provide. The world can only give us um, physical and in some ways materially derived uh, pleasures. Whatever money can give you, ultimately it's, it's because uh, matter we've made matter into certain quantifiable things, delightful things, right? Shane company or uh, this kind of uh, status symbol like Patagooch or whatever. Um, but ultimately there's, there's something more and you get tuned into that when it's like, when you stop seeking after possessions or relationships or whatever, and you start seeking for immaterial goods, not just things that make me feel good, but actually make me participate in something that's beyond myself. Maybe you found that. Maybe you're married. And you find a deeper fulfillment in giving yourself to another person. This is where you raise your hand, Patrick. Okay? Like he, he's found that. He's the only one that I know that's married. Um, <laughs> friendship is one of those immaterial goods. It's beyond what we can create for ourselves, and it's a gift. And that gift is something that we want to participate in. So when we start looking beyond, we realize that I have a longing for greater goods than this world can give. Infinite truth and goodness, something to give our lives to, something that fills our hearts, a love that's satisfied. We are searching for, this is Father Matt's mic drop moment, bum, bum, bum. The meaning of life is to live in communion with God. 
The meaning of life is to love and to learn to love the right things. And ultimately, it's not about things. It's about persons. Mankind, the meaning of life, is to learn to live in love with persons. God has made us for communion with himself. God has made us for communion with one another. God has made us for communion within ourselves. That we wouldn't just be of service to others, but that we would actually be in friendship, in communion with others. So St. Augustine says, our hearts are restless, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Um, the desire for God is written, this is another catechism paragraph, so we've only covered, you know, in this, in this whole, you know, course or whatever, we've only covered four paragraphs, 127 and then like something from the 150s or whatever. The desire for God is written in the human heart because man is created by God and for God. And God never ceases to draw man to himself. Only in God will he find the truth and happiness he never stops searching for. So as you kind of recall the goods for which you were made, you can start to say, what is the meaning of my life? What's the purpose that God has for me? In short, like if you were to create a mission statement for yourself, why am I here? The meaning of life, the purpose of life, is to know, love, and serve God in this life and to be happy with him forever in the next. There used to be a time in the, in the church where we, we taught from something called the Baltimore Catechism. Some of you maybe have uh, grandparents or friends that went through this. We asked them to actually say uh, these short statements uh, about why they, what we believe as Catholics, right? I don't want you to think about anything, you know, Catholic school or Christian school or whatever else. What do you think would be the effect if you stood every child up in a school and made them say at an assembly, why was I created? Why was I created? I was created to know, love, and serve God and to be happy with him forever in the next I'm created to know, love, and serve God in this life and to be happy with him forever in the next. Do you think that that would start to change the way people saw themselves? The, the ways in which they saw others? The ways in which they saw their families or their state or the, uh, the communities in which they gather? I think it would. Because if we don't understand the identity and mission, we're going to miss out. So we're made for supernatural communion with God in this life and forever in the next, to be filled radically with God's own life and love and to live radically for him. And the image is like God wants us to receive fully these kind of bowls or chalices, and then the, uh, the overflowingness would actually spill into others. But it wouldn't just be uh, something that we, we didn't really have anything to do with, but it would actually be our choice. My delight, my joy would come from Loving, serving, and pleasing God, um, knowing God uh, forever, and, and, and serving him in the next. So the last part, um, which I understand, like, um, in order for us to be able to grasp what God has for us, we have to come to understand prayer. What is listed afterwards are a number of different de definitions of prayer. Um, I would like you to review that on your own. Many of you know what prayer is, or you have different ideas. You have heard the phrase, you say your prayers. You lift these kind of words up to God. Maybe you're accustomed to lighting candles, or reading scripture, or um, just praying for people, like uh, offering intentions, or intercessions, uh, petitions for other persons. Those are all different forms of prayer, but prayer is much greater than just doing things. Prayer is actually a being Ness. It's an openness uh, to what God has in store. So ultimately, like to savor the beauty of creation is in part a prayer. To enjoy a good chocolate is in itself a prayer if we lift ourselves up to the source of all of those things. So uh, on the next, uh, in the next kind of passages, you can kind of look at um, what different examples of prayer are. The goal is just finding time for prayer. And so Father Matt was uh, generous enough to kind of make you little, little prayer books. Sometimes we don't know what to say. It's just like, uh, um, what sounds good? Like, what's ordered? 
These are all sort of fine prayers, right? If you say to God, I feel good today, and it was a great day, I'm thankful for the gifts you gave me, had that great conversation with my friend, and got home safe from work, that's a prayer too. So don't think that lofty language impresses God more, right? I'm going to make my act of self-consecration to you, O Lord. That could be as simple as, Lord, I give you my heart. Thank you for making me uh, in communion with other persons. I want to love people more. But these uh, prayers can help you and kind of help you to, to make your own language. So, you know, you might read short stories, but then eventually you might write your own short story. You can read other people's prayers, but ultimately I hope you offer your own prayer. And then the last thing is, you can pray at any time. But if you just say, oh yeah, I'll just pray later, I'll, I'll, I'll pray at a different point. At some point you have to choose, all right, here's what I'm going to pray today. And I'm going to pray for just a short time. My doctor, my friends who are physical therapists said that if I did just 15 minutes of plyometrics a day, I would see benefits like for the next however long, right? Theoretically, right? Okay, so if you do the same thing with prayer, 5 to 10 minutes, 5 to 15 minutes, you're going to start to see benefit because you're going to be strengthening those, those muscles. Okay? So let's just say a short prayer. God, we love you, and we strive to believe and to confess that you love us. Help us to hear your voice this week. Help us to lift up to you our hearts. Bless uh, this community as they go forth today. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.